this is Jason Augustus Newcomb, and I want to welcome you to Inside the Magic Circle. Uh, today, my special guest is a magician who has been uh, studying in a scholarly way the Greek magical papyri for a number of years, and, and she's in the enviable position of having so much material that she could probably fill eight books or so, and, and in the unenviable material of wanting to get that down so that she can actually get a book completed. Um, she's also very well known as a maker of talismans, um, and, and there's a lot of unique things about the way that she approaches that, and um, we're going to discuss that and also her sort of journey through magic. Um, I'm, I'm welcoming, of course, Allison Chikoski. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It is my great pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> um, so, um, to begin with, so I always ask this at the beginning. So you, you, I know that you kind of came into magic a little bit later in your life, and that's true of a lot of people. Um, it's not true of me. I, I began really young, um, but I'm always interested when someone comes into it a little bit later in their life. Like, what sparked your interest in it to begin with? Um, so it it's complicated to say that I got into it later in life because I had uh, things going on in in my life early. Um, but I only found book magic later in life. Um, what, and, so, so what was going on before that? Uh, so before that, I had interactions with spirits in the wild. Um, I had just experiences, um, things that were personal and hard to categorize. Um, but I've always had an interest in the occult and the paranormal to try to figure out what those experiences were were like. So, so you were you were actively interested and aware that you were having spirit contacts. You just didn't sort of become more interested in reading about it until later on, or become aware that there was a lot of literature about it. I didn't know that there were uh, good books that actually taught you magic until pretty late. What was the what was sort of the the first book that that you entered into the into the you know book magic with? So it depends. Um, the first uh, scholarly book about magic that I, I had that was pretty good was Manly P. Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages, which I got uh, in when I was a teenager. And I thought it was uh, just so full of wisdom. Um, but having revisited it again as an adult, um, I kind of have to take a lot of it with a grain of salt. Sure. I mean, that's true of a lot of magical literature, too. It though, is. <laughs> However, uh, the book that got me into Solomonic magic and practicing was uh, The Seven Spheres by Rufus Opus. Oh, interesting. I just I just recently had an interview with him. I, I that's that's interesting to know that he that he that he sparked your whole magical career. That's that's fascinating. So did you work through that book or just use I it did. as inspiration? You did. Yeah. So uh, that was the first uh, that was the first book magic I'd worked through. Um, I went to a occult convention that he presented at, and I picked up a copy of his book there. Um, and then I went home and uh, was working out like within a week or two. Wow, that's great. That's what I was just complimenting him on that book and saying that it's it's a very workable book. That it feels it feels you know I could do this when you when you when you read that that information. <laughs> It is, and I, I think that's something that I want to speak about briefly because uh, I was I was in Facebook groups about this sort of magic, mm -hmm. and I felt like a lot of the posts there made it seem like things were too hard, and I may never have gotten into this sort of magic without something that was that easy. So while I've heard people complain that it was too basic, I think it was just perfect. I think there's always going to be someone who complains about anything as being too basic unless it, you know, contains, uh, you know, 500 footnotes under each page and, uh, you know, that's, you know, that anything other than that, somebody's going to say it's not, it's not, you know, sufficient or something like that. But, um, but that's great that that, that that was your start. So um, in, in working with, uh, with, with, through that system and afterwards, you know, sort of what, what how, how then did it blossom to the point where you were making talismans and, and, you know, doing things in, the, in this fashion. Because one of the things that I think is interesting, um, when I was coming into magic in the in the 1980s, 
there was really a stigma against sort of being a professional magician. It was okay to write books on the subject, but if you were someone who was selling talismans or you were someone who was selling even sort of like magical tools and stuff like that, it was kind of like when, when people are supposed to be making those themselves, you know, like there's no, this, that sort of commerce was really sort of frowned upon, but about, I would say about 15 years ago, it really started shifting. So, so what, you know, what made you feel, you know, ready to start offering stuff uh, to the, to the marketplace? So the reason why I got into making uh, pentacles and talismans like I do was because I had friends that had a great need for them. Uh, so I was doing that for, uh, I guess, almost two years before I went into business doing it. Um, and I probably never would have gone into business uh, as a professional sorceress if I hadn't been laid off from my corporate job. So I had, had a job in corporate America for 18 years, and I thought that was going to be the career that I had until I retired. Um, but they reorganized everything, and they were like, oh, we don't need this team. Uh, so um, as I was trying to figure out if I wanted to put on uh, a suit and commute via train to another city. Um, people started contacting me to say, hey, I know you make these things. Could I buy them from you? Now, do you, do you feel like that was sort of the spirits themselves helping you to, uh, to move into, you know, doing what you should be doing? I do. I do. I, uh, it's, it's funny in hindsight how you can see how everything plays out. Mm -hmm. um, but also I, I slightly blame myself in that I kept asking spirits for more money um, as a salary. Uh -huh. And at a point I just, I just got to the point where it was very hard for them to get me more money in the corporate position and the big oh. company that I worked for. Sure. There's and then, only so many raises you can get in a year. It, it's true. <laughs> and then uh, it was, it was very disruptive to lose that security but um, now I don't have that cap. So right. just, you know, do Sky as well. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what, what brought you to focus on the, the Key of Solomon talismans primarily? I know you make some things from the Greek magical papyri too, but it seems like the majority of your, hey, by the way, I, I asked you before and you, you have a couple of them around you. Show, show, show everyone your, your, uh, your talisman that you have on your neck at least. The, um, so that, that's what she does. And then you had another one on your wrist too. And that's a more recent um, way of doing the talisman, yeah? Uh, yeah, so I've, I've started to come up with different ideas for how people can better use these pentacles. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people say, hey, I've got eight pentacles. I only have one neck. <laughs> how many pentacles, yeah. You look like you're wearing dog tags or something, right? I um, know, it's <laughs> the Mr. T joke. So uh, w one of the things I also think is really interesting about the way that you do um, your pentacle work is you, you do a lot of sort of field testing of stuff before you launch it. So, I mean, you've, so you've, you've the, that way of doing calcins, I imagine you've experimented with a number of people before you even made that a commercial project, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So everything that is completely brand new. Um, so if it is a new type of pentacle that I haven't already made, um, I will generally make uh, like four to 10 of them and send them out to people. Um, and I'll send them out to a variety of folks who are either uh, very good at spirit work, but also people that are very bad at it so that I can see, okay, this is how it performs when someone can get feedback from the spirits of the pentacle. Mm -hmm. And this is how it performs as a baseline when the person can't interact with the spirits. Or, or rather, the interaction is only one way. Um, Another thing that I think is fascinating about the way that you sell your stuff is that you have a very visible and very full um, review section on your uh, on your page, so you can really see people. And it seems like you interact back and forth with them a little bit. So there's like a there's a real sense of uh, almost community around you know how people are utilizing your talismans and and what they're getting out of them. So I mean, if you if you if someone wants to um, to examine what, whether they think that you would be a good talisman maker, you have kind of a lot of stuff for people to think about right there on your page. You know, oh, this, these people like this. And so yeah, and I've I've been I've been in business for two years now, so um, getting that 
feedback uh, app set up was one of the first things I did when I got a website. Um, so that's being managed by a third party and people get automatic um, prompts to uh, write me a review after they've had the Pentacle for about 20 days. So, um, and, and you have no control over what happens with that, right? So it's not like you can go, no, I don't like that review, I'll get rid of it, right? It's, they're all there. Right, I could unpublish something, but it would still contribute to the score. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I still have almost, uh, I think I, I'm at a 4.9 because, you know, you can't really have a five if anyone has ever said less than five. Sure. But, and, you know, but, there's, there's always going to be an unsatisfied customer in any kind of thing, even if you. Yeah, I've got well over 100 reviews and yeah, still remain. Amazing. Yeah. So um, I, I want to talk a little bit because um, in these interviews, I've primarily been focusing on people's sort of inner worlds because because I, I want to. Um, I think a lot of people who are fairly new to magic, they don't know sort of what it is in a lot of ways. And, they, and when they read people's writings or they, re, or they see people talking about things, they often get sort of misleading perceptions about how amazing other people's work and lives are or how unamazing they are. You know, they, they get these sort of strange thoughts in their minds because we, they have a limited connection. So I, I wanna take the opportunity to kind of talk with people who are actually doing this work and get a sense of what what their experiences are like and what they what their beliefs are and how and how they function. So the first thing that I that I'm curious about is like what do you see a, a spiritual being as? You know, a spirit uh, that you work with from from the the grimoires or, or elsewhere. What, how do you see that? Um, that's a hard question because I think that um, I think that spirit. There's a lot of different types of them. For one. Um, so I would say that the spirits that we consider to be angels are themselves very unique and would be very different than um, a land spirit, um, you know, or a spirit that's attached to the land. Um, I, get, the, the, I guess the question that, that really comes up a lot in discussion is whether, whether spiritual entities have a separate existence that is entirely their own and they're doing their own thing. And when we call them, they're sort of coming to us or whether they are sort of more almost an energetic pattern or, or, you know, and, and, and in the, in the least way that I don't think really very many people believe they're just simply a part of the psyche. Um, so, so where do you sort of fall into that, into that sort of pattern? So I definitely believe that spirits have their own lives and interactions. Um, I've talked to spirits that know other spirits that I work with and will remark on them. I've even talked to spirits that will remark on other practitioners. Um, so um, they're definitely doing things that are outside of my head. Um, and so when you're, when you're interacting with these spirits that, that, are, that are giving you this information, how does that information come to you? Is it more in, in the, like an, an auditory um, experience or is it more of a, of, of a feeling gestalt experience or how is that information coming to you? It depends on the practice I'm doing. So uh, sometimes I work with a scryer so I can get really clear uh, auditory feedback from the scryer. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I just know uh, what they're saying in my head. Uh, sometimes I can almost hear it in my ear, like someone was uh, right there and speaking to me, but that's the rarest for me. And so, um, and yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna ask, like what is the frequency of each of those experiences uh, uh, manifesting? Right, and then I also have a, a, an entirely separate practice where I can go into a trance mm -hmm. and um, leave my body and go talk to spirits that way, which gets me a different type of communication. And so that's that's almost you're being the scryer at that point. Yeah. In a so, way. it it depends on what I'm doing. Um, what are what are the situations in which you generally would employ a scryer? Um. I would generally employ a scryer if I'm looking for something very complicated. So recently, my scryer and I have been working together to find out ways to uh, consecrate stronger magic items. Mm -hmm. So we, we've been going back and forth like, hey, what if, if we do this, will it make it stronger? How about this? Um, and then, you know, once we get positive responses from the spirits we're working with, then we'll go try them out. And see if they they really do come out to be stronger. And that would be that would be that same process that you talked about before, where you give it to a someone who's pretty in tune with spirits, and then give it to someone who's not in tune with spirits, and see how it how it plays out. How would yes. you 
one of the things that I always sort of struggle with myself, and I and I think a lot of magicians struggle with, is how how, how do you determine whether something is a stronger effect or not? Yeah. So so when it comes to something that I've already made, and I'm just trying to see if it's stronger. Uh, I can actually just hold them in my hands and feel, hey, this is different and this is stronger, uh, or no, these are about the same, or this has a slightly different flavor than the other. So I have that added bonus that I can kind of feel the magic in something. Um, so that's kind of a shortcut for me if it's something that I've I've already made before. So um, sometimes. Uh, other practitioners will correct uh, the Hebrew on pentacles, and uh, I'll try to make those, and I'll say, okay, here's one that's slightly different. Here's one that's the way that I used to make it. They've both been consecrated in the same window of time. Uh, let me hold both of them. Do they feel different? How often do they feel different? Um, so it's it's interesting because sometimes the results that I get from them are not what I would expect. Uh, like I would I would think that something should be equally as strong, but it'll be weaker. Or um, I would think that something would be stronger, but no, it's just slightly different. Um, I've even tried uh, recently. I've been partnering with an astrologer who does scholastic image magic, mm -hmm. and we've been. Uh, using electional astrology to make pentacles. So I've been getting up at like 4.03 in the morning or something on, on some odd day so I can crank out some pentacles in these tiny little election windows and consecrate them in the same time just to see if it was any different. And, and how, how is that going so far? Does it seem like there's, there's positive uh, feedback from the universe on that or no? Um, we uh, the jury's still out, uh, but it's uh, it's it's definitely interesting. Well, it sounds like we're gonna have to have a follow up interview at some point in the future. Definitely. <laughs> um, so, so in terms of your of your ritual practice, uh, what 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 uh, what does your temple look like in in the way that you conduct things? And there's no right or wrong answer here. I don't want you to feel like I'm putting pressure on you. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of people do it in very different ways. I've been very surprised so far how much variety there is in things. Do you lay out a traditional circle, or how, how do you how do you manage your space? So the first thing I want to say about my ritual room is that uh, unlike most people's ritual rooms, I try to keep it as barren as possible. Mm -hmm. So I have almost nothing on the walls. Um, I've got uh, almost no altars that stay around all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, up until I started professionally consecrating pentacles, um, I would put up an altar, do the ritual, and then I would take the altar down um, because I like to have I like to have a lot of open space so that I can echo around the room. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that adds to it. Uh, whereas I think if it was cluttered with all of my magical stuff, it would just not have the same echo. I mean, I, I actually really agree with you in a lot of ways in that. Um, I, I, I have a different way of managing it, though, but I, I just I, I erect curtains around my whole magical areas so that I, I don't have any input from anything because I have too many things to possibly have an entirely empty room in anywhere in my house. But, but I, do, I do try and keep the, the ritual space as spare as possible, largely because I feel like there's other things that are there and it just it, it messes with the energy of what you're doing. But, yeah. but uh, I don't wanna get too much into me, but, that, but that's interesting. And so do you lay out a circle within that space or do you just um, have a psychic circle or how does that work? Uh, it depends on what I'm doing. Um, usually I just lay out a psychic circle. Um, Sometimes I make a circle with natron. Mm -hmm. uh, I made circles with chalk before. Um, it really just depends on on the type of operation. The, the sort of stuff that you're doing. Yeah. And and uh, a, a number of uh, magical practitioners these days do a lot of things where they really kind of manufacture a lot of their stuff at a very intense level. They make their own candles. They make their own threads. They have virgin daughters that they they get to weave things for them and so forth. Um, how much how far do you get into that sort of stuff? Do you just use sort of store-bought candles or candles perhaps purchased from one of them <laughs> or how, how do you manage that that sort of like the, the the tools of the trade well as far as candles go um i'm actually just picking up most of them at the dollar store so i get those uh seven day candles that yeah. 
you know, they $1. have some green ones at the dollar. So they're all kinds of different colors. So and I, I get them by the crate. <laughs> <laughs> um, they even have I, black ones sometimes. So that surprises me. Yeah. My, mine only ever has white, but that's really all I need. Mm -hmm. um, so I also have uh, quite a lot of friends that are makers. Mm -hmm. So I will pick up, um, you know, I've gotten incense from Adley Nichols. Uh, he makes great stuff. I picked up a ebony wand from Freder Ash and Chasson. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gorgeous. Uh, I, you know, I've got um, my friends over at Devil's Conjure that make oils. Mm -hmm. So I will often add uh, a condition oil to the candle. Um, so for example, uh, he makes an oil called the Oil of Jupiter's Expanse. Uh, and I just add that to my candles when I'm doing Jupiter work. Interesting. Um, and so, so with a seven day candle, that's a lot of candles. So do you only use that then for Jupiter work or do you dump other oil into there later? Oh no, I, I will, uh, I will use the entire candle for one ritual and let it burn out. So I don't, um, snuff it and then relight it. I've got a setup where it's pretty fire safe. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's no curtains nearby. Uh, it's either on ceramic or metal. Uh, so even if the glass were to shatter, which has occasionally happened, yeah. there's just no way to go. Um, it'll just pull into the metal. Um, so I just, that's, I will leave. That's important practical advice for, for the young, the young magus out there that you want, you want to make sure that your, that your candles are in a, in a, either you, that you're not leaving them lit or that they're in a situation where it's not going to cause problems because they do. It, I mean, it, it, you're, you're inviting yeah magical stuff into your life and there's going to be explosions and all that kind of stuff happening every once in a while. <laughs> I, I, I actually knocked over my candle on my most recent Wednesday ritual. So this past Wednesday, knocked the candle over during the ritual. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I've uh, left a, a setup before and come back to, I've never burned down my house like uh, Rufus Opus, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but I've come back to an altar completely aflame uh, on more than one occasion, unfortunately. But so um, in terms of what you're doing in, in your practices, do you follow um, a particular grimoire? Is there or does it sort of change uh, as per what you're doing? So it changes as per what I'm doing, but uh, influence from the Greek magical papyri has crept into everything I do. Uh -huh. Uh, so some of those things include um, heavy use of the formula from the Staley of Jew, the hieroglyphist, mm -hmm. uh, and also um, that's the the headless rite or the or the the bornless ritual to so that yes. <laughs> so so that and then also intoning vowels to help mm -hmm. set the base for planetary work. And do you do you have a vowel assignment for each planet, or just using all seven vowels just to sort of connect with that that universe? Um, I I do have a vowel assignment for each planet, but I usually run through all of them. Mm -hmm. So, and is that something that you use at the beginning, sort of as almost like a frame, right? Like someone might use a vanishing ritual of the pentagram or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, speaking of the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram, I don't have any experience with. Um, Golden Dawn or any of that style of magic. So there's there's, there's none, none of, of that. that. Yeah, That's which a lot of people find really uh, odd. Like, well, no, I mean, it's just, a, uh, I mean, there are there are plenty of people who have, I mean, who <laughs> there, there's there's not that many people who haven't done a pentagram ritual of, of any sort because it, it's, you know, crept into witchcraft and so forth as well. But but certainly the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, that's a, that's a certain slice. But that's interesting that you, you've never, you've never explored that at all. Right. What about Kabbalah? Has that ever been a part of your, uh, your, your path at all? Uh, so I've read about it, but it doesn't really seem to impact my practice at all. It, it's certainly not necessary for the things that you're doing. So <laughs> it's a, it's, it's interesting though, because it's, it's, it's so permeated throughout uh, Western culture that it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of fun to meet people who, who don't, have that as part of their their thing at all. It becomes less and less a part of my thing the year as years go on. But um, it certainly was, you know, in my in my sort of teens when I was first exploring uh, tarot and stuff like that through the prism of the Golden Dawn. You know, it was it was definitely a big part of what I was doing. But um, anyway, enough about me. I keep getting I'm I'm very uh, self centered today for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you're when you're working with a spirit directly, um, so. Y y 
you mentioned that you you hear things in various ways. Um, how do, and how does seeing go for you as well? Is that, is that something that's a big part of it or not? Uh, seeing is not a big part of it, but I have made the fourth pinnacle of the sun, which is a uh, pinnacle for seeing spirits, mm -hmm. and I and it works. So you're you're I, getting that going. In yeah. That. So I, it's it was it was actually really interesting the first time I used it um, because I could I could see. I could see something in my scrying um, crystal, uh, like I have a little scrying ball, um, and it was like it was out of focus, and someone just kept turning the focus until it, it came into focus, and then I was like, oh, that's a face. <laughs> <laughs> so um, your magic seems to be largely focused on, on the practical, like you, you're mm -hmm. definitely sort of a results-oriented magician, um, and so, there are, there are a number of different sort of um, lenses through which people approach magic. Some people are more on the scholarly side and they like to, they like to explore the history of it. Um, some people are more on the feeling side and they like to just sort of have experience the sort of the, the energy and the connection that you can, that you can obtain from it. And then there's a third kind, which, which um, I like to call the, the, the perfecting magicians or the evolutionary magicians. And, and those are ones who are, specifically seeking to use magic to sort of raise themselves up a scale and and you know very often those are those are cabalistic but also planetary you know you know uh, sort of grades and so forth where you're supposed to be becoming more and more you know enlightened or connected with god or whatever and it seems like that aspect of magic is uh, that third one is is a little bit fading from the scene in some ways. Uh, where where do you fall with that? Do you feel that your magic is is about you growing as a person, or is it more just about you growing as a magician? Uh, so I focus on growing as a magician, um, and I have separate practices for growing as a person. Uh, so, for example, things like uh, psychological alchemy. I would not consider that to be magic, though a lot of people. Um, I just consider that to be uh, a type of self-help. Um, and so what do you mean by psychological alchemy? Uh, psychological alchemy would be going through uh, things inside yourself and going through the processes to transmute them uh, so that you keep changing as a person uh, and are more refined into what you want to be. And it's one of those things that doesn't actually stop. So you don't do it once and then you're like, okay, I'm done. Um, but it's a constant process of uh, looking inside yourself to say, is, is this what I want to be? Are these the, thing, the qualities I want to cultivate in myself? And if the answer is no, um, then, you know, going through those processes to try to dissolve them and calcinate them and, and whatnot. I always find it fascinating when people start talking about alchemy because there's so many different sort of um, perspectives on even what alchemy is and also you know there are different people teaching even the same sorts of ideas where did where did where do your ideas on alchemy sort of germinate from are they who, who, who's your sort of inspiration in that that was uh, Hauck, H-A-U-C-K I think he wrote the Emerald Tablet the psychology of personal transformation uh, so a friend of mine loaned that book to me years ago and I thought it was really Really great. Interesting. I, I, I think that you, you kind of, I'm not sure if it, how it will come out, but you cut, up, cut off, but I think you, that you were saying Dennis William Houck, is that, is that yes. correct? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I only heard Houck at the very end, so, um, but I thought that's what you were talking about. So, and, and so you, you've been working through that yourself, not with, a, with a, a formal mentor or anything like that, just your own? Yeah, so I would consider that to be entirely separate from all of my magical work. Mm -hmm. um, my magical work is looking to find practical uses for these spells. So, for example, uh, we mentioned the uh, Staley of Jew, the hieroglyphist, before. Um, I've got this uh, thing that I do where I can use the formula from that spell to compel inanimate objects that are broken or malfunctioning. So I've used this to start my car when it was dead before. Um, and unjam power tools. Uh, I use it to fix a hot pot at a friend's house before a dinner. Um, and uh, additionally, I posted about it in the PGM study and practice group so other people could have a shot at it. On, on Facebook? 
Yeah, and there's and there's over 100 comments in that thread where people are saying they fix their air conditioner, they fix their refrigerator, you know, they fix their printer, and all sorts of other things. So that's great. So I mean, basically, seeing seeing a broken uh, piece of technology as something that has been taken over by a, a daemon that is that is negative, because I mean, it's it's an exorcism spell, yeah. So basically, so you're getting well. Rid of I mean, not necessarily. Um, the, I mean, first I'm only using the formula, which is the subject to me all, all diamonds part. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not doing the whole, the whole spell. I'm just, you know, doing a, a little paragraph that I can remember off the top of my head. Okay. Um, sure. And uh, it's really more of an animism type where I don't believe that uh, my car has been inhabited by an evil spirit. I feel that my spirit, my car already had a spirit, and this is me petitioning the spirit to just try really hard. <laughs> okay. So that, that seems like a good attitude, too. Right. So, so a lot of times I'm, I'm like, okay, coffee maker, I'm begging you, please, <laughs> spirit of my coffee maker, please make me coffee. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about the Greek magical papyri because you spent a, a huge amount of time studying it. You have, um, from the, you know, you've shown me a little bit of the stuff that's, that, that, you've, that you've gotten, but it seems like you just have gobs and gobs of reference material and, and you know, you've created this sort of giant uh, file cabinet of information on it. Um, yeah, and you mentioned, you mentioned earlier that some people take a scholarly route and some people take a practical route. Mm -hmm. um, I'm separately taking both, so uh, my all of my devices are full of academic books and uh, you know books on magic in the Greco-Roman world and uh, articles from academia about you know the history of writing in Ptolemaic Egypt and things like that. So I, I am trying to take um, archaeology and scholarly work and use that to better contextualize how to do this magic that I want to get practical results with. So how often does that scholarship sort of lead into a change in your practice? I am unsure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, I don't know that it necessarily has changed my practice as much as it helps me understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is the big quest in in all of you know all of knowledge, but in magic in particular, is to sort of what is it what is it that's happening? What what is the mechanism? Because then the more you understand that, obviously, the more you're able to push right. the lever, right? <laughs> to, to be quite honest, I know I know a lot of folks are are thinking. Um, you know, they're out there and they're just beginners and they're like, wow, when I have a few years under my belt, I'm going to have all the answers. And I'm, I'm here to say that that's not true. <laughs> and that every year uh, some questions get answered and they just raise a whole host of new questions. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I know, I, you know, for me, the, I, I love to study this. So a lot of the same stuff that you're studying. And for me, it's almost like it's a, it's an it's an aesthetic pleasure in, in discovering what what people were doing as much as anything um, although I do think that you know in many ways we we have we are so many layers of culture away from sort of the origin of the first people that were that were doing this stuff that it's it's valuable to examine that just to sort of be able to connect a little bit more even non-intellectually with with the what's going on you know the the spirit of the of the thing, not not just the you know the, the essence. So what 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 in the Greek magical papyri are you most excited about right now? What are you looking at right now? I mean, I know you're studying something, but like as soon as we get off of this thing, you're gonna be you're gonna be looking at something. What is it that you're gonna be doing? <laughs> I, I've been I've been tracking down uh, some context on the headless right, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, I found some some really fascinating things about who that headless spirit might be uh, from folklore. Who who do you think that it is? You I'm going to write. Yeah, yeah. She's, gonna I, keep that, know, she's keeping that under her hat for now. It, it's these things are so much better with citations and, and quotes, um, rather than off the cuff. 
Dr. Stephen Skinner would, wouldn't tell me a number of things that, that you know, were part of his life. So <laughs> you're, you're in good company with wanting to keep a few things for, for your future publishing and just for your own, uh, um, you know, explorations. I, I know I, that you're, I know that, I know that you studied a lot the, the, the symbols that, that are sort of non, non-linguistic, the characters and, the, um, what what about those draws your draws your attention? Um, well, everything in the PGM is interesting to me, um, and they're so prevalent in both the PGM and also on Greco-Roman gems of the period. Mm -hmm. You find them on Greco-Roman gems. You find them in the PGM, and you find them on on artifacts like the. Uh, triangular bases from Pergamon and Sardis. Mm -hmm. um, so it was definitely something that was uh, leveraged a lot, but there's there's not a lot of writing on it. Um, there, there There is a little bit of writing about it in the PGM. Do you feel that there's a a way that someday we're going to logically understand the choices that were made or do you feel that they're it's all spirit inspired and it's not there's no you know rationality to it where do you fall on that uh, i mean i i feel that those spirits are as accessible now as they were back then for us uh to ask them questions so in some cases i've done that and then i use those answers to help me um, propel my research forward. So I don't want to just take something that a spirit says to me to heart, uh, even even though I trust them. But I'd also like to be able to find some things in books and archaeology to help support what they're saying. There are there are a number of symbols that that seem to occur only once or twice throughout the entire body of literature. But then there's mm -hmm. a, a, quite a few that that are used a lot, uh, um, like the sort of the eight spoked um, star with little circles around it is just everywhere. And, and the, you know, various crosses of, you know, it, the, those are fairly frequently occurring. Do you feel that there's like, that there's a consistent intent behind the presence of those things? Or do you think that people are using them in different ways? So I suspect that uh, they are being used in similar fashions as they're being used in the Picatrix. Mm -hmm. So that those are, um, related to the stars and uh, energy traveling in paths from the stars. So a lot of times those little symbols will have several dots and then there'll be lines between them. And uh, while the lines between them may change, um, if you just look at the dots, uh, there's a lot of dots that are really similar. So Interesting. you add as like a grouping of three stars but then the lines between them could designate different patterns of energy coming off of those three stars. The other thing that I see in those a lot is, is things that at least appear to be letters, uh, particularly Greek or um, Coptic letters that have been sort of stylized in some way, but they really seem like letters. And then, and there'll frequently be a couple of those and then something that clearly isn't a letter and then maybe another one, you know, so there, there, there seems to be this, this sort of strange, um, uh, you know, not non um, logical way of, of doing things. Do you, do you feel like that's just a symbolic form of the same thing as like the, the, the voces magica that are, you know, that's just the, it's, it's a non rational kind of uh, expression, or do you think that there's actual like kind of intent behind each of this? I'm just curious because uh, I'm sorry if people, if this is not something that's interesting to you, I'm just curious because I don't get to talk to people about this that often. Someone who's spent a lot of time on it. So in one case where I have specifically held up the book and asked a spirit, like, what does this say? Mm -hmm. um, it was a spirit name. So it, it was an alphabet that spelled out a spirit name, but it was additionally related to the stars. Okay. So I mean, certainly the spirits and the stars aren't necessarily disconnected from each right. other. Uh, also regarding the um, uh, barbarous names or the voces magic A, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that they're nonsense. Uh, and I think that uh, a lot of people um, have taken things to heart about them, but that they're really just untranslated sections of the PGM. 
Um, and as time progresses and research progresses, we fill in more of those holes. Mm -hmm. So as we discover what they mean, uh, they tend to just mean more of the same. So more of the same names and titles of the gods that we're seeing in the rest of the spells. Uh, so I think thinking of them as different um, substantially is maybe, maybe not the right way to think about that. Another thing about those um, s strings of, of uh, vowels and strings of you know, consonants and vowels, um, there are patterns in them very, very frequently, you know, palindrome patterns, but very frequently those will not be consistent from one entry to the next. You know, there'll be one spell that spells that has an M where a B would be and so forth, um, or just is missing a, a letter, otherwise it would be perfect. Do you feel that those are mistakes most of the time of scribes, or do you think that there's an actual different intent in those things? Uh, so, so I think that, uh, so the vowels, the, the vowel strings are separate, but regarding palindromes, uh, I think that sometimes typos do creep in. Uh, and I also see them in some of the formulas of the PGM. So there's, there's certain magical formulas that are very, very prevalent through Greco-Roman magic. Yeah. And sometimes you'll see them and they're just like slightly off. And I'm like, hmm, you probably just typoed that. Right. I mean, especially since you're doing it by hand and you're probably doing it quickly because it's not necessarily literature that you're supposed to be having in your hands. Right. So. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, maybe, so also, maybe that. you're paid by the book, <laughs> you oh, know. Sure. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You want to get through it quickly to <laughs> move on to the next copy. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you you know that because you said oh I, I wanted to ask you about this um, many of your um, talismans are hand inscribed but I've noticed mm -hmm. that there that there are a few that that are not and and um, so what is the difference between those yeah so I'm I'm starting to work with um, a partner from Industrial Magic uh, who has another company and they've they've helped me with things like the uh, I'm going to hold this up to the yeah screen back. This is the uh, pull it back because we're a little we're we're just seeing clear. Okay, I think that's that's probably good enough to see some of it at least. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's the Mars bracelet. Um, and if you could see, it's got very 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 tiny engraving on it. So it's allowed me to help miniaturize things. Uh, and we've tested it to make sure that the magic is no less strong. Um, and so that is all the pentacles of Mars, all on one on one bracelet. No. So this is a combination of ones from. Uh, the clavicula solomonis and also the veritable key of solomon okay um, so in this i just paired ones that i thought were um related to war winning wars protecting yourself against seen and unseen enemies so i went with a whole theme of uh making this bracelet of total war so um, are you are you wearing it today because you feel like are you wearing it today because you feel like you were worried that you and I were going to be at war? <laughs> is it protecting no, uh, you from me? <laughs> I, you know, if, if this is something that gets televised and people decide that they want to use spooky mojo at me through... Ah, you're protecting yourself. ...video yeah. like that. Uh, this isn't just me being paranoid. It's interesting because uh, last night I did an interview with uh, Stephen Skinner um, and he... and he he was he he's got a very strong presence and he was talking a lot about spirits and, and various things and literally after he, he got off for no reason my children were insane for hours in a way that they never are they were just running around the house and dancing and being totally crazy and i was like has he <laughs> sent something over to my house that has taken over my children so i did do a little bit of the clearing but that um with no with no offense intended to your spirits <laughs> But, um, so yes, I, I I certainly think that that's that's not entirely outside of the realm of possibility. So good, um, at least you're not protecting yourself from me. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, so what's that? We're we're friends. Yes, we are. <laughs> so um, tell us about your website where people can find your stuff. Yeah, so I have a website. It's uh, www.practicalocult.com. Pretty easy. All one word. Uh, all one word. Um, and uh, I've got a link to my store there and also uh, 
a link to interviews that I do. So if, if this gets aired and there's a link to it, I'll put a link to it there. Thank <laughs> you.